we are scientists, we know that data shows diversity powers innovation. Yep. We know diverse workforces actually lead the way in innovative uh, science. Um, and so we just have to keep pushing forward. Hello, I'm John Fox. I'm the director of the Del Monte Institute for Neuroscience at the University of Rochester, and I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of Neuroscience Perspectives. We have a fantastic homegrown guest here today, uh, Dr. Nathan Smith, who is the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion and an Associate Professor of Neuroscience at the School of Medicine and Dentistry right here at the University of Rochester. His research focuses on the brain's immune system and has the potential to shape how diseases such as attention deficit disorder or epilepsy are treated. He has received numerous honors and awards, including being named one of the 1,000 most inspiring black scientists in America by Cell Press. And in 2021, he was elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science as a fellow, truly prestigious uh, honor. Uh, Nathan, fantastic to have you here today. I was just, you know, add to that, actually, this time uh, last year, I got to introduce you personally as a distinguished uh, lecturer at the at the FENS meeting, the Federation of European Neuroscience meeting uh, in Paris, uh, where you were really speaking to thousands of people and gave a fantastic lecture. Uh, your, your star is certainly on the rise these days. You've had an amazing journey into science. I'm going to, we're going to come back to that at the end. Let's, let's dive into your research first. And now you work on a very specific cell type. You know, when people are thinking about the brain, they, uh, they've all heard of neurons and they think about the neurons. Right. But you work, you work on another class of cells that have maybe an equally important role in the brain. Absolutely. Do you Absolutely. want to tell us a little bit about these, these oh, cells? Oh, yes. I work on glial cells. In particular, I work on astrocytes and microglia. And these are two important cells. One is the immune cell of the brain, the microglia, and astrocytes. Well, I call them the stars and parents of the central nervous system because they are not only important for homeostatic properties, but they also uh, are important for informational processing, which, now come in, which is now coming online as we speak based on the new research and the techniques that are being developed. Right. So the, so this this is a cell type that that has an immunological function, but it, it's it's also doing it also has a second set of of processes where it's actually involved in the in the machinations of the mind as well. Absolutely, yes, both actually. So yeah. you know, people ascribe and astrocytes have immune properties, but microglia is known for their immune properties. But secondly, what we look for in my particular lab is outside of their pathological functions or their immune properties, how they are regulating uh, neural, neural processes. In particular, how the microglia are actually modulating plasticity, synaptic plasticity, as well as how astrocytes are modulating plasticity. But I do have to say that for my thing is I am very biased because astrocytes are at the center of my entire research program and how astrocytes dictate to microglia and microglia will dictate to neurons and vice versa where astrocytes can also dictate to neurons as well. Right, right. right. But all modulating that plasticity. And and if you went back 20 years, maybe 25 years, the people's conception of glia was as like, you know, kind of a relatively dumb yeah. set of cells that were just there to sort of like a scaffold or structural yeah. they were just glue most people believe glue. that they were right. just holding the brain together glue they didn't have any relevance or in, in importance and that was due to the fact that we didn't have any tools to actually measure the, their properties and see what they're doing right right and, and and just you know again like for for the non-expert out there i mean these these glial cells they're not they're not always stuck in the same place either right they these these guys get around <clears throat> Yes, in particular, the microglia definitely move around. So microglia will move. They will basically send out their processes, extend and retract their processes to survey the parenchyma, their environment, basically to see if anything is going on, right? And when they do sense that danger is happening or some type of injury, then they will move their entire their processes as well as their body, the cell body, to that area of interest to help um, clear out that debris or that, that damaged tissue. Right, right, right. And, and you use uh, imaging techniques to, to watch these cells move, to look at them operating. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the technologies that, you, that you're using? Absolutely. You know, it's been a long time now. We are able to look at astrocytes and both microglia in particular using two-photon calcium imaging, right? Uh, and so basically we use these fluorophores called as a G-CAMP, um, 
uh, genetically encoded calcium indicators inside of these cells, which allow us to look at the calcium dynamics. But we also have another fluorophore, which is TD tomato, which is a static uh, fluorescent protein that allow us to watch the movement of their processes and they move around. And so basically in my lab, we can actually look at both. We can look at it in situ or in vivo. Basically, we cut slices of brain and we can image things in real time uh, while the slice is alive. Or we can actually make these cranial windows on the mouse head and actually image how these cell types are interacting with each other in real time as well. That's incredible, right? And, and then they, so, so these are super important to normal function, but they, they can, yes. they can get off on their own. They can get off on a jag and, and oh, absolutely. can end up with inflammation and stuff. So they play a big role in, in some of the pathologies that we, that are well Abs known to us. Absolutely. So we normally think of these cell types are working normally under normal physiological conditions, but things can go awry where they become pathological and they could do more damage than good, uh, especially in disease states. Uh, and one in particular, uh, one disease that always popped into my mind when I first learned about microglia was at the University of Utah when I was working with Mario Capecchi on a collaboration with uh, my postdoc mentor at the time, John White, uh, and Mario Capecchi looked at microglia in particular, the disease called trichotillomania and that's basically where humans will pull out their hair and eat it and actually most people thought it was just a neuronal uh, uh, neuronal disease a uh -huh. disease are responsible by neurons but it turned out to be it is actually a disease that is caused by microglia uh, 30 percent of very small population of microglia and uh, is hox b8 is like they have a special gene that is found in the the, the the people who express this disease. Uh, and basically, when you take those microglia out, then people will actually store, I mean, the mice will exhibit the same functions, I mean, the same uh, uh, phenotype that we see in humans, right. and it will pull out the hair and start to consume the hair. A completely extraordinary phenotype Ex shared by a human shared and a mouse. Shared by human mice. Uh, on the, the basis mouse, of one subtype of glial cell. One subtype. And it's like, that and that's, mutation. and it was, and that mutation, and it was unbelievable because usually we don't see this, that's right? Amazing. We never could get the, uh, when we create these mouse models, we never could get the mouse models to capitulate, recapitulate the human disease in its full capacity. Yeah. But that was the first time I've ever seen where it does, the, the, where the microglia, that you put these disease microglia in the mice, and they can actually recapitulate the full brunt of that disease, yeah, trichotillomania. Exceptional. Absolutely amazing, yeah, yeah. Now, how did you get into glia? I mean, so let's, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. How did you get into science? Where, where, when did the love of science develop? The love of science developed when I was a young age. Uh, when my mother bought me uh, like a little microscope, and I used to like, catch little butterflies outside and examine the wings under the microscope. Uh, and it started when I was little. I was I was a avid reader and everything else, but I always loved science. Yeah. I always wanted to do science, and most of the time, especially in my family, was like, "Oh, you can either do a doctor, but you don't hear about scientists." But yeah. you know, and so I had that dream of becoming a cardiothoracic surgeon or, <laughs> or oh, wow. a neurosurgeon. Okay. Yeah, so but you were really heading off in the like, clinical. Direction. Oh, when yeah. you were very young, though. very young, yeah. right? And it was all due to Ben Carson's book, uh, "Gifted Hands." It was like a that. book that was passed down to many uh, in African American families because Ben Carson was like uh, a hero to us all. Um, and we read that book, and you get captivated. And I was like, "Oh my God, I I yeah. want to do neurosurgery. I'm now interested in the brain." And it all started from there. That's amazing. Yeah. So. You grew up in Louisiana. I grew up in a great state of Louisiana. In New Orleans, or I grew up. My family is from New Orleans, but I grew up in West Baton Rouge Parish, uh, in a small in a city known as Brule, Louisiana, which is, if you translate it from French, it's burnt. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in Louisiana and Brule, Louisiana. You're a long way from Louisiana up here in, in the, oh, the yes. great northern <laughs> climes of Rochester. <laughs> oh yes, but you have a, you have a long history here, at Rochester. Yes. Will we talk a little bit about that. It went to uh, undergraduate in Louisiana. It, that was a compromise I made with my mother and my grandmother. You were at Xavier. I was right, at Xavier yeah. University of Louisiana. Yeah. And they said, oh, once you graduate from high school, we would like to, for you to stay uh, in the state. And But when you do professional school or graduate school, you get to leave the state, right? right. So they wanted to keep me close. Uh, and so I graduated from Xavier, and I came up here to Rochester. Um, and I took a year out from school because during that time, I lost my brother and everything else, so I needed some time to recuperate. Right. Uh, and I took a year out, and then I decided to do uh, work as a lab tech. Um in uh, Hisham Drissi in the Center of Musculoskeletal Research. And that was my first taste of a full on blowing research that was not associated with a summer undergraduate research program. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and it was really interesting. I got advice from an old mentor long ago who said, if you're really interested in something like neuroscience, you should do something outside of neuroscience to see if you like it, right? And so I did that. And orthopedics, it was unusual. I was like, oh, you know, I'd never be interested in the bone. 
you know, I'll do orthopedics. Yeah. Uh, and it actually turned out to work out really, really, really well. I uh, ended up getting my first first author paper within six months. Uh, Very good. Wow. And Hisham Drissi, Hisham was a really good mentor. I was his first, basically, you look at, you know, I was his lab tech, but I was also his first graduate student in a sense that uh, we worked really well together. And we got him that as a new investigator. It was very important for him to get those papers out. Yeah. And we got that that his his foundation paper out. It was really, really nice. Yeah. And that's um, key. It really kicks off a, a career too when you get that really first does. first author paper out as, as a as a really as a research tech. Right. right? Yeah. So right. It shows the you know it's like a mile it's like a threshold and that milestone, right? Just like once you cross that milestone, it's like, oh it's really interesting. Like, yeah. like you know what I could do this. And literally after that happened, it's like, hmm, you know, I could do this. It's not that hard. You hear lots right. of stories and everything else like, oh it's so difficult. You have to put in long hours. Yes. But it's this always light at the end of the tunnel and it and that pivotal moment right there showed that I could do it. Can we turn the clock back though? Because yeah. I'm I'm totally fascinated. And I think, you know, I think folks out there, youngsters, will be fascinated to know, you know, when you, when you were in school, like are you are you from an academic family? No, I'm not from an academic family. It's like um, most of my family, my brother was went in uh, firefighting and stuff like that, cops uh, and we had nurses in the family and stuff right, like that. Yeah. But no true academic uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, both person. of my own, both of my own parents are nurses. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting, right? But so, and and yet, your mom bought you a microscope. Right. Now, that and that was through persistence for me because ah, as a, I was okay. persistent because I was like, oh, I really would like to. You know, you watch all of these uh, television shows and everything else, and I can't remember. I think it was watch. It was watching MacGyver, and that really set everything in motion. It's like, wow. It's sort of thinking like a uh, scientist, just wanting to. I look at science like putting a puzzle together almost like you're figuring out a puzzle and you put in different pieces of the puzzles together until you get the full the thing completed right, and that's right, the way right. i look at it yeah um, and even that today. U- utility component of it the macgyver component where exactly. you can you say you i'm gonna to, take a piece of sellotape and a bit of this right. and a bit of that and we'll build this and it's we'll just make it happen shooting kind of troubleshooting right and yeah. I, I always explain to my students it's like you know research is about troubleshooting you have to you know things happen we have to pivot on demand and stuff like that. But it's the fun thing about research is the troubleshooting part because you learn so much yeah. doing that troubleshooting yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so, and then you went to Xavier and you were studying biology. Yes, Xavier. Yes, I went to Xavier and my major was biology pre med. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. So you were still, there oh, was still this thought I might be heading over in the Ben still, Carson direction. Still heading over in the Ben Carson direction, but it was that, that time in orthopedics that switched it. Gotcha. That told me, yeah. I, th- I should have explained it better, that showed me that I can do the actual science part of it, right? right. It's not the impossible. Right. And being and you know, being the first person to like go into science. You yeah. Know, I found yeah. I was like, oh, I could do this. Now, so. now, so let's get back to the family. So when you said, I'm going to go off and do this esoteric PhD business, how, how were the folks at home about that? Were they totally supportive? Or were they saying, what, what about that doctor thing? No, you know, my mother, I, that's the good thing about her. She's all she was the type of mother that's like, I will support anything you do. Right. Okay. My grandmother was also very, I was very close to my grandmother. Yeah. So it was very close to my grandmother, and she always wanted to push us to go for our dreams. Yep. And she knows, like, that's your dream, you go. And you have to do work one, 100% harder than anyone else, but yeah. I know you could do it. Absolutely. Given that, that fire to keep going and shooting for our, getting yeah, yeah. our dreams. So Important yeah. women in your life. Oh, yeah. God. It is so important that... The, the nurturing and the the instilled values they lay in you, the hard working until you can, you know, things may not always work out, but you keep going. You keep shooting and keep thriving, shooting for those stars. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the important, uh, some of them, one of the important lessons I learned from that um, actual experience from them. And I always think back because my grandmother passed away in 20, uh, in 2014. And I was like, oh. Yep. You know, and I still remember her words. And I remember even as a graduate student, my friends, when I came to Rochester for graduate school, I used to always give my grandmother uh, isms and how, you know, certain phrases to help them overcome certain things. They were yeah. like, oh, Nathan, I know your grandmother would say this and I could do this. So, yeah, it was just like it was one of it was just so wonderful because now I go back when they we all have our reunion and they come to visit. They always say those grandmother isms, and yeah. it's so funny. Um, and I think about it, I was like, oh, that's my tribute to her. Uh, and my tribute to both my mother, who is still with us, is to always strive for the stars and yeah. always, um, always. 
pull people forward, right? Yeah. And that's what my heart is. My a big part of my my drive is looking at back looking back at the next generation that come for us. And I think that's the biggest drive right. for me is and the to people make sure. that people that raise you up, right? And, and, and they raise me up and, and now, taught you perseverance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Taught me the perseverance and everything else. And now I want to raise the next generation up. Let's pick up on on this theme of raising up other people in the sciences and that and again you know i know i know that this is literally a cornerstone of who you are as a human being right. so you wear two important hats here one is you're, you're a superb scientist in, in your own right you're running a lab publishing papers and doing all that good stuff but the other piece of your portfolio is in your role as an associate dean for equity and diversity right. and uh, it's quite purposeful your return to this institution but can we can we dive into that? What it, what it means to be the first black male uh, graduate of a program like ours, and and to come back now and take on this leadership role here in the program? It meant a lot, right? It's like okay, people who look like me have someone they could look up to and say, you know what? If he could do it, I right. could do it. Right. And that is the whole essence of my being. It's like showing people that actually, if I did it, I know you could do it. Yeah, and it, going back to the importance of a. a black male neurosurgeon and a book handed to you as a youngster and how seeing somebody who walks in your shoes tre tread that path at successfully to the very top is it was, it's it was, important it's extremely yeah. important right it's like i remember you know when i got the book from my cousin and i read this book and i was like oh my god i didn't even think this was possible i've never seen anyone who looked like me who achieving this this goal to get more people uh who look like me uh, young males young women uh, in to the sciences and say, wow, you know, that is a, that's a viable option outside of medicine, right? I mean, every, everywhere I go, when I go out and do outreach in the community and everything else, we always hear medicine, 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 because no one hear about, oh, you can also do a, you can also be a scientist. You can also right. touch many lives by the discoveries that you can find in a lab. Yeah. You know, I know what one thing you often say this to me. Actually, we, you, uh, the viewers may not know, but like you and I spend a lot of time interacting, and you always say we have a lot of work to do. We oh, have a yes. lot of work to do. But at the same time, when you look at look at where we're at today, what, how do you feel about it? I mean, is it, are we are we are we well on the way? Are we part on the way? Are we getting there? Hey, John, as you know, you've known me. We got to know each other for a while. I'm an opt. I'm a, a perpetual optimist, and people's like, "Oh, you're too optimistic." I think we are getting there. Yeah. We, we're definitely on the way. It's more work, right? We we can't like say, "Oh, we can stop now. We've made it." No, it's just more work to do. But I think we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. One of the things that you were absolutely instrumental in establishing here at this university, and I know it's been picked up at many other universities, is our Neuroscience Diversity Commission. Oh, yes. And we have a set of programs there. Do you want to tell us a little bit about those and, and what they mean and how they operate? When I was still in D.C. at, at my other institution, uh, maybe I get this email from you asking and say, like, hey, I really want you to set on this. I was an alumni member of the university and alumni member of the, of the program to set on this commission. And I was like, you know, I... Yes, I will. Because you, you've seen a lot of places, and I think this is important to to note, you see a lot of places put out after in the wake of the death of the tragic death of George Floyd, put out of those diversity uh, supple, uh, statements, right? Statements, yeah. And it was like, oh, it was like words, 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 but no actions. And the one difference between Rochester and, uh, and the other institutions was actions and right the diversity commission actions and it was like let's do let's create programming let's change the narrative and make things better and not only that we have the resources for you to do it um right. and <clears throat> i have to say it was it's been extremely enjoyable by working not only working as an alumni member when i was away but now being a faculty member on the commission um and to help build programs that actually help diversify neuroscience in general, right? We have done a lot as a commission. I mean, the first is the Neuro East program by bringing high school students from East High into Rochester, give them their first research experience. Mm -hmm. That is unheard of, right? It's it's different from going in and showing people or telling in, uh, young uh, students, hey, you could be a scientist one day. No, now we're taking them in our labs and showing them, hey, it is very possible. You can actually pipette and do all the things that we're doing as scientists right. and see yourself in those roles, right? The other one is NeuroCity, going into MS uh, minority serving institutions, MSIs, um, like CUNY, uh, City College in New York City, bringing students who have never had a research program, who've never had research experience 
into the University of Rochester, showing them the true potential that they could achieve and putting them in labs where we know that they will thrive because that's a very important thing. Yeah, yeah. Put them with mentors that we know who are interested and willing to nurture this person to reach their true potential. Another, which is a program dear to my heart, is NeuroYes, which is where we take senior postdocs uh, in t- and invite them to do practice job talks. And now we have added chalk talks to it uh, and give them that experience. And we have been very successful in the 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 fellows who have gone through a NeuroYes program have all emailed and said, this has been an amazing program. I am so happy you have done this. So this is a program, right, to, just to clarify for folks, where, where people who are getting on that first rung of the job market and going exactly. out trying to get a faculty position get to practice all their, their, exactly. their skills that, that maybe folks from privilege would have picked up along the way anyway. Oh, where absolutely. It's where, yeah, they so would have those opportunities ahead exactly. of time. That's right? really, really important. It's just yeah. a huge change in the narrative. I mean, I've said on many panels, you have said on many panels, the one thing I hate hearing is, oh, we can't find people with diverse perspectives. We can't find them. And I was like, I don't understand. We're not yeah. hiding anywhere. We're the out right. there. We have now, you know, Black and Neuro led the way in creating a directory where you no longer have to say, oh, I can't find them. Here they are, right. right? And I think by changing that narrative and removing that easy, which I call a cop out, by yeah. saying oh, we can't find anyone, well, now we're putting them right in front of you. Where right. they're ready, right? So right, exactly. what, what, what else, what's your excuse? And making sure that the next generation exactly. is much more representative of the population that rep- uh, in the United and, States, and, yeah, in the world, right? Right. So, so that not everybody coming through the system looks exactly. one way, exactly, and, and, and enriching. Everything exactly. in the process. We're scientists. We know that data shows diversity powers innovation. Yep. We know diverse workforces actually lead the way in innovative uh, science. Um, and so we just have to keep pushing forward. The last program that we just had um, is Neuro to All, where we have the students and faculty go into the community and educate the community about neuroscience and teaching them how to, teaching them about neuroscience and they can go on and teach neuroscience to their families, et cetera. Just spreading the neuroscience um, excitement across, right, right. <laughs> across the region, and basically. Exactly. And what's more exciting than trying to figure out the workings of the human exactly. brain. My God. Exactly. So a question for you, right? So you need um, folks like you to step into the breach in the right. diversity effort and initiative and help us do this. But of course, what it does now is it steals a bunch of your time. Now you've got a job. You've got two jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard enough to be a successful scientist in an extraordinarily competitive market right. with limited resources uh, if that's the only thing you're doing. But now, now you have this leadership role. How, how are you? How are you thinking about that balance? Because there, there are loads of people out there who are going to be saying, like, how the hell are you going to manage these two portfolios? I always get this question, and I actually got it this past week. Um, I always tell people you can walk and chew gum at the same time. But the most important thing is because I know it is it's look the onus for diversifying neuroscience or any aspect of science should not be on people of color, women, right. people with disabilities, et cetera. It should be a collective group working together. Yeah, this is crucial point. Right. That is yeah. a crucial point. It's like we should it's everyone at the table should be working to change the narrative, should making making sure that people with disabilities, people who are who are uh, URMs, um, people who are sexually, uh, have sexual orientation differences, should have a seat at the table. We should work together to make sure everyone is represented and everyone has a fair seat at the table. However, the reason I took my position and the reason I wanted the leadership position um, is the fact that I wanted to represent people who felt that they didn't have a voice, yeah. uh, who didn't have a voice at the table and who fear that they, if they do speak out, they won't be heard, right? right? Um, and so I balance it like, I balance it like it's tough. You know, I'm going to be real with it. It is tough, but I do love science. I am still doing experiments. And I know sometimes um, my students, I tell them, oh, we're coming, I'll come in on Saturday, we'll train and stuff like this through the week. But it is a, it's a, it's a fine dance, yeah. but I manage it. But and there's, also, a, there's a vocational street to this, right? This, oh, is a, this is a piece of who you are, Nate, right? It is, it yeah. is who I am. And also you have to have the resources. You know, I, I saw like we had people or I should say institutions will hire people and that person is going to fix all of the diversity problems. <laughs> That's impossible, right, right? Right? They shouldn't, right? But you you have now tasked that person to fix all the diversity problems with zero resources. And it's just that person. Right. Um, and so when I uh, talked with Rochester about this and set up two stages, I do have a team on each side, right? right. That right. helps out. You need a team. So you, you were given, given the, the support structure to oh, be successful in both of those spaces. Absolutely. Not to, yeah. 
And that, it's and that's not, crucial. I'm not yeah. carrying a weight myself. I have a team. So projecting out like ten, mm-hmm. like 10 years, 20 years, which bit of it do you want to be known for? When you think that's, about how it's going to go, there's a piece of you that's policy, leadership, and and then, then there's the pure scientist piece of you. You think you're going to keep them both going, or what? What would you want to be known I, about, for? I think I would have to. I would, honestly, I think it would be both because I think they're both intertwined. Yeah. Um, because again, until we balance it out, until we see that it is a fair representation across the board, because our science will not be innovative, we don't have a diverse workforce in the lab. Yeah. And we won't be able to push those boundaries of science, right? So I would rather be known for both rather than having to pick yeah, yeah. because I think. I truly believe this in my core that they are both intertwined. I totally think that's the case because one of the things, of course, about being a credible leader, let's say, in the neurosciences, is that you're you're seen as a credible scientist in your own right. That right. that's what gives you the leverage. It's what gives you the 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 um, gravitas with with your community. And I think it, it's oh, a, it's an important important combination. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic to get to chat with you and to to hear your thoughts on these these really important issues. And uh, it's been a great pleasure of mine to witness you operating and working hard and working hard on behalf of people of every background. You're really, really a leading light in the field, uh, Nathan, and it's a pleasure pleasure to be around you. So oh, thank you. Thanks for coming on Neuroscience Perspectives. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. <laughs>